Good afternoon to all honorable guests present, speakers, and all the keen students who have taken time out of their schedule and have honored us with their presence. Um, I'm Millie Mishra. I'll be the moderator for the first panel session of the day. Um, welcome to the panel discussion on how to take a bold step forward as an employee in Australia after student life. Uh, for this panel, I would like to invite our prestigious guest, Dr. Sally Bird, who is a policy and research manager at Independent Higher Education Australia. She is responsible for IHEA's work on international education. She received her PhD from ANU in 2011 and has taught in ANU, Monash University, and UNSW, and is also a visiting fellow at University of Florida, as well as West Point Military Academy in New York. So we'd like to invite you, Dr. Sally Bird. The second guest for our panel is Mr. Troy Williams, who is Chief Executive Officer at Independent Tertiary Education Council Australia since 2018. ITECA is a peak body representing independent providers in the higher education, vocational education, training, and skills sector. Troy Williams is an experienced policy advocate and has highly nuanced approach to evidence-based policy development. He has served as director of the former Property Services ITAB and Property Services GDO. He's also a fellow of the Australian Institute of Managers and Leaders, a member of Australian Institute of Company Directors. He currently serves on General Counsel of Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. We'd like to welcome Dr. Mr. Troy Williams. And finally, our third panelist is Mr. Paul Williams, who is the head of the international business for TAFE NSW, a role he took up just this month. Previously, he has been Deputy, General, Deputy Regional General Manager at TAFE NSW, Sydney Region, and he has over 25 years of experience in tertiary education in New South Wales for the Commonwealth and New Zealand. I'd like to welcome Paul Williams. Thank you all for honoring us with your presence. Um, without further ado, we'll begin with the panel. Um, we'd like to know first, what is IHEA and what role does it play in encouraging employment of international students within industry? Um, okay, so IHEA is a peak body of uh, independent higher education providers. So um, we don't use the term non-universities because there's a couple of independent universities, but uh, other providers are mostly not universities. Um, and so they're the non-publicly funded part of the sector. Um, so we're a peak body that represents the provider. So we don't directly represent students. However, our provider's main game, obviously, is protecting student interests and providing the best education and, and training that they can for uh, students and so we have the connection that way. In answer to the question what can we do about employability I think the best role that we can play is to encourage best practice among our providers and ensure that our providers are the ones that are doing the best that they can to make sure that you end your course of study with the best opportunity for employability that they can. Uh, there's other things that can be done in terms of making sure there's linkages between them as a provider and industry and employment uh, opportunities, ensuring that the course that you study is the right course for the employment outcome that you want and you seek. And to do that, you need the best information you can have before you're enrolling. So we ensure that that happens. Um, providing linkages, providing opportunities for employment and making sure that you have the skills to, to be able to get to uh, that employment outcome is the main game. Um, I'll say more, but I'm sure that'll come up in other questions. <laughs> Um, employability is basically having the skills and capabilities the employers want, right? And then being able to 
for yourself. I think the biggest key to it is for yourself being able to identify the skills, knowledge, uh, and, and attributes that you've acquired through your study to sell to the employer. And I think the biggest problem that graduates have, and it's not just international students, it's all graduates. Um, you graduate, you're inexperienced in the job market. You aren't well versed in the breadth and depth of employment opportunities that are out there. And there's also an onus on uh, the institution that you attend to make sure that you come out of your course of study with the ability to sell yourself, to recognise what skills you have developed over the last whatever period that you've been studying, and to be able to sell those in the right way. So I was talking to a friend on the weekend who's a CEO of a huge employer, and she is advertising for a relatively high executive level job. Uh, and she was telling me, she had someone call her and say, I'm thinking of applying for this job, but I'm not sure that I have the skill set. I've seen the selection criteria. I sort of think I might fit most of them, but there's a couple there. Like, what do you actually mean by management? And so she said to this person, OK, here's the problem. Right? You are looking at it from the negative. Don't look at it from the negative, because the person that gets the job will be the person who thinks, reads the selection criteria and thinks, I can do 50% of that job and the other 50%, you know what, I'll wing it and make it work, right? So she said, don't tell me about what management roles you haven't had that we are seeking a manager for. Tell me about the leadership you've done in your life, employment, experience, right? So it's all about how you present yourself and how you're looking at the skills you've attained and how you market those to your employer or potential employer. And it's thinking outside the box. I, as an academic, I was teaching arts degree subjects, which are notorious for you have to mould your skill set to what you think you want to do, right? You have to be able to recognise all those hidden skills because nobody's sitting out there saying, you're a nurse now, you're a doctor now, right? You have to make that work for yourself and, and find your own career path. I think uh, that was a very good set uh, that at the end, it's the students who have to keep a more positive approach. Um, if I could ask uh, Mr. Troy Williams, um, it can be very tiring for students when the job hunt becomes, uh, they're about to graduate or have just graduated. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to students so that they stay motivated? Look, firstly, from the perspective of an international uh, student, it'll probably come as a bit of a surprise, is many of your experiences won't be any uh, different than domestic students, locals. Uh, I sit on the uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry and we do a lot of work with the employers helping them match the next generation of workers. So these are either school leavers out of the secondary school system, out of the vocational system, or out of higher ed. And the experience is almost always the same. Um, and so the first one is, is don't give up. But the other thing is you've got some natural inherent advantages as international students. Uh, if we look at, we employed a graduate uh, in our Canberra office, and it's a great person, cannot speak highly enough of them, but they've lived in one little town in regional New South Wales their entire life, and they think Canberra of all the 300,000 people is a big city. You guys have a far broader experience, not only of Australia, but also of the rest of the world, and that brings real experience and real knowledge. And leverage that for your role. So if you were lo looking in um, a career in, say, mining, highlight the fact that many of you have international experience and if you've ever been on a mine site or if you've ever been working with a surveying team, they have quite a mix of diversities there. If you're looking for a job in tourism or hospitality, you've got some natural advantages there in terms of language. Uh, and similarly, if you're looking at some of the professions, we do a lot of work with uh, KPMG and PwC and others. International students have particular advantages there simply because you've got a global outlook. It comes, it's innately who you are. And so use your natural strengths. Uh, and of course, quite often, um, you know, recent graduates or those who are about to graduate fall into the, the same habit we all did when we finished school or university. We're too busy trying to align our qualification. We're not, still not quite sure exactly what it, how it makes us relevant to the job. From an employer's perspective, that qualification is the starting point. We've assumed that once you've graduated, that's the core requirement. Quite often from an employer, we've just, yep, that's the tick in the box not to disparage the four years you've just spent, but that's the tick in the box. What we're looking for as employers, uh, whether it be in education where Sally and I work or whether across the rest of the sector, is who you are as a person, how you employ that and how the rest of your life experience will translate into that particular job, into that particular workspace. And as I said, international students have particular advantages that many domestic students simply won't have. Thank you, Mr. Troy Williams. Um, I have my next question for Mr. Paul Williams. Um, 
In your 25 years of experience, uh, what is some of the common things or the best skills you have noticed in the international students who get these good jobs and they have these big ambitions? What are these skills? Are these transferable? Are these something unique they have learned in their subjects? Um, well, I'm going to start by saying I agree with the previous speakers about um, focusing on your strengths and, and leveraging uh, the diverse cultural skills that you, that you have. Um, I regret putting in 25 years, particularly after hearing BJ's CV. I thought, gosh, I've been, I've been quiet over these last 25 years. Um, look, I would say the thing that I hear most regularly is confidence, enthusiasm. Uh, the slides that Thinker put up, uh, punctuality, reliability, adaptability, uh, those are all fundamentally important. I agree with Troy's comments that your experiences are probably every bit, if not potentially better, uh, than the domestic workforce with which you're competing. Um, in the training space, uh, I just want to touch on a, on a question you put earlier to Sally. Um, th there are limits to what we can do as training providers. So TAFE New South Wales is set up by, by legislation, uh, and there are limits to what we can do. But I'm sitting here thinking, um, perhaps where we're not told we can't do something, so perhaps where we're told we, we're not, you're not allowed to do something, we could do more. Uh, so we do have great relationships with employer peak bodies, uh, the Chamber of Commerce and the like. Um, and I think maybe we could engage a little bit more uh, actively uh, to get ahead of um, the, the employment cycle uh, uh, and, and start talking with employers about the great advantages that they, they can potentially take advantage of by, by engaging international students. Um, so I'll just say, say again, I think in my experience working in New Zealand and in Australia in Commonwealth and state roles, um, I, I don't think having a deficit approach is the way to go. Uh, I do think um, the skills and experience you have as international students migrating from one country to another uh, gives you uh, perspective and, and judgment um, and resilience that may not be available in the domestic workforce and you need to talk it up. Um, but I think there's a piece of work to be done around employers and the way employers go to market uh, and um, recognise the skills inherent in international graduates and stop focusing on things that might not be as strong. I'll just finish with this one last point. I engaged a young Vietnamese woman uh, a few years ago, quite a few years ago, uh, and when I went to do her refer I'd interviewed her. When I went to do her referee report, her, one of her referees was incredibly enthusiastic, incredibly enthusiastic about her punctuality, reliability, skills, judgment, written skills. But then right at the end, he said something that stopped me cold. He said, she sounds a bit Vietnamese-y. And I thought, wow, so that's still there. That's still there. You're still talking about a person's accent. You know, I hear people from... from um, from New Zealand, where I'm from, who I think you sound hilarious. Um, but, you know, accent, really, that's going to be an issue. So I've got to call it out. There's still some of those issues. But I think focusing on enthusiasm, reliability, adaptability, and the, um, the judgment and experience you have from migrating is a way to be on the front foot and, and not on the back. Thank you so much. Um, that was a brilliant, brilliant answer. Um, what advice would you give to international students who are seeking employment but have very limited um, experience in the Australian business environment? What are some of the things they should be focusing on? Uh, okay, Troy, thank you. I'll start. Um, look, I, I think that deep engagement um, beyond your study is the way to go. Uh, Troy mentioned it before. before. Um, volunteering is fantastic. I mean, the idea of paying for an internship, uh, I think that's appalling. Uh, just absolutely appalling. I'm not surprised to hear it, but, but I think it's appalling. Volunteering, getting involved in, in uh, clubs and societies on campus, uh, getting involved in, in cultural groups, which is obviously important to your own um, enjoyment in, in a, in a um, visiting country, in a new country. Um, you know, to an extent, you've got to learn the, the cultural skills of the country that you're resident in. So, you know, sports clubs. Sports clubs are really important. Uh, not everybody wants to play footy. Um, but, but, you know, having some of those cultural skills uh, can be quite useful. But I, I just think um, having a volunteer uh, experience outside of your, your training experience is challenging if you're working 
as well as studying, but I think those are, are really important ways to um, build your cultural skills. And the last thing is, you know, using professional networking such as this. I mean, being involved in the International Students Association, I think, is enormously advantageous. Uh, and the networks that you'll build up by fronting audiences like this uh, and, and participating very actively in professional associations is a great way to build up your professional network. Look, I'd uh, just like to back that up. Uh, over 20, 25 years, I've employed a lot of graduates and assuming you've got two graduates whose technical skills are roughly the same, almost always the shortlist has had those who've had some sort of volunteering responsibility. Now, there's two reasons for that. One is it provides um, some practical expertise, but from an employer's point of view, from my point of view, what it does actually shows leadership. If we're employing a graduate, there's an understanding, look, it's going to be a, an interesting 12, 18 you know, months as we invest in them, help them get the skills required. But of course, what we're actually looking for is what their uh, capabilities will be once we get beyond that. And I've yet to meet an employer, whether they're looking in the professions, whether they're looking in the trades, who isn't looking for some sort of leadership. They want the ability to have a supervisor. They want the ability to have a team leader. They want the ability um, to mentor other staff. And uh, quite often from where I sit, that's always shown when there's been some volunteering, whether it be in a sporting club, whether it be with Caesar, whether it be with elsewhere. As I said, so we get, um, as I said, we just didn't, uh, set up a new Canberra office, had CVs all over the place and three or four graduate positions. Uh, and it was a deliberate effort on our part to pick out those who've showed the capability to take some, and I'll be blunt, ownership of their own life. They weren't just expecting to finish their degree and have the jobs come to them. They were willing to go out and, and get uh, experience that was relevant, not necessarily to their, um, to their chosen profession, but to who they were as a person. So what are the resources IHEA provides for students who gain a meaningful employment and how can these be accessed by the students? Um, so we don't provide any kind of employment service directly. We work with providers to do what we can in that space. Um, and so there's no sort of thing that you're going to be able to access um, as, a, as an international student that I hear directly offers to you. Um, but what we can do is what we're doing today, we work with CESAR and groups like that to hear what your issues are, hear what we can do better, um, and then take that back to our providers and give them the advice. This is where we could do better um, in, in providing employability. So it's important for you guys to be able to feed back and use your associations that way as well. They're there for that. They're advocating on your behalf. We're advocating on your behalf. Um, so we use those networks for you on that, in that sense. So yeah, get engaged. The other thing I'd just say about the, the access to the Australian employment market too is networking. Um, I haven't met anyone that isn't just flattered by the concept of someone saying, hey, I'm really interested in what you do. Come, you know, can I have a coffee with you at some point that's convenient to you, right? And I had to work really hard at that in academia because you'd walk up to someone that's written a billion books that you just think is fantastic. But the best thing you can do is just walk up to them and say, hey, do you want a coffee? I'd love to talk about your work. And I haven't, like I say, I haven't met anyone that hasn't said, you know, no, I hate talking about my job and being flattered that someone's interested in it. All right, so, I mean, and, and do it without the expectation, though, that this person's then going to go out and find you a job. But use that as, a, as an information venue. How, how does employment work? How do I, what's the best way to get a job? How, you know, what networks that you are in can I tap into and how? And just showing that genuine interest will help and it'll give you probably some way down the track at least a, a kind of referee that you could use um, for that sense. So, but do it with, you know, I mean, it's not going to be completely altruistic. You want a job out of it. Um, but don't go in it with the expectation of I'll have a coffee and you'll get me a job. That's not going to work. Okay, I think uh, all the students would keep that in mind. <laughs> How much coffee can you drink, though? Oh, I've, I've, had, I've had a day in Canberra where I've had 12 coffees and no lunch, I can tell you. So just, and no sleep. And no sleep. The rest of the so um, my next question is... Um, Again, when international students graduate, they go through the whole process of job hunt, and it can be sometimes a bit tiring and demotivating. Uh, what strategies could be used uh, by the tertiary or education sector, as well as by students themselves, so that they use their skills and they don't lose the knowledge that they have just gained? Um, two things. Um, one of them is completely unrelated to the, the question, but the premise of it. If you're busy looking for the worst work, the worst thing you can do is fill in the applications in the morning and spend the rest of the day at home. Uh, you will get, I'm about to swear, you will get bored 
very, very bored. Um, even if it's simply, sometimes it's a case of just getting out. But the other thing too, which gets to it, is have a look at the opportunities that are there uh, in terms of the early point about volunteering. Uh, and internships, even though post-internships, there are a couple of mechanisms where you can volunteer your time and continue to meet visa requirements. Uh, and have a look at those. Because if you've got particular expertise and it particularly works for medium to large employers um, who've got the capability to support you, most will be pretty adaptive to that. But look, the, the major piece of advice is um, don't sit at home waiting for the phone to ring because on balance it won't. You need to be a little bit more proactive and as I said, go out and get involved in, in some organisations that um, will enable you to not just get the experience but also meet particular employer, uh, employers. Most jobs, and the numbers bounce around a lot, but you'll see a huge number of jobs are never advertised. Uh, and of those jobs which are advertised, a large number quite often go to someone the employer already knows. Now, for a whole range of reasons, you've got to market test it to make sure that that person you already knew was right for the job. But you know, two thirds of the jobs out there are either not advertised or actually go to someone the employer already knows. So it's a case of, as we said, use your volunteer networks and others to, to build your network of contacts. And in, as Sally suggested, that might mean having a few copies. Uh, I'll be very brief, and I don't know the composition of the audience in terms of whether or not you're active um, job seekers or not, but, but um, I've done a lot of interviewing over the last few years in Take New South Wales where we've uh, gone through a lot of uh, change and recruitment, and I actually wrote about this a while ago because um, uh, I kept seeing the same thing. So just building on what Troy said, um, whacking in a CV to an online portal just not, not, even, not even close to good enough. I strongly recommend that you actually research the company, like I'm sure you all do. Um, if there's a contact uh, uh, listed, I'd ring that contact. contact. I wouldn't ring that contact and, not, and, and ask just any question off the top of my head. I'd ha I read all the information package and, and, and what's not there and what do you genuinely want to know. And if you have a two minute conversation with our contact person, your name's in their mind when your CV comes across. Um, now, I, apologies if that's not relevant to you, you you're not job seekers, but um, for those of you that are, research the company, understand the position, read an annual report, look at the published financial information if it's available, um, work out through LinkedIn if there's anybody that you know in that organisation, have a conversation, as, as Troy and Sally have talked about in terms of networking, read published articles, but ring the contact because uh, you need to differentiate yourselves from every other application that comes across. Last thing, and this is possibly the most important thing, you've got to understand their recruitment strategy. So if you're applying for a job in the New South Wales State Government, there is a very, very clear uh, framework with, within which you must operate. If you don't address all the selection criteria, you don't make the short list, even if you're the best candidate out there. I'm not saying it's a good recruitment model, I'm just saying it is the recruitment model. Now I know the New South Wales public sector recruitment model, I don't know the recruitment model in the private sector, but if you can get your head around it and understand what they're looking for, contact the, the, the person who's listed and, and present your application in a way that they are looking for, then you're in the game, then they're actually looking at your merits, otherwise you're one of 60, 90, 150 applications that are just undifferentiated. So you really got to make that effort and um, I'm sure you'll do because you're at a conference like this. Just one quick thing uh, too is the, the, the public sector, uh, I call it procurement, which is even worse, uh, employment process is quite uh, structured. Within in um, private companies, it's all over the place. You know, large companies have quite a structured one, small businesses, um, you know, it's quite often just it lands on the desk. The one thing I can tell you though is um, CVs, you'll hear it time and time again. Most of them come across my desk, if I spent 30 seconds looking at it in the first instance, that's actually pretty long. Most of them it needs to be quit, pretty quick. Um, you need to be able to summarise it, but also personalise them. You know, we went through, as I said, about a dozen jobs down in Canberra. Most of them were dear sir slash madam. And simply what that showed me is this person is just going through the process. They really didn't care. And these were, some of these were good jobs. Six, uh, figure salary jobs, you know, $150,000, $160,000 a year jobs that, that do, dear sir, please, you know, sir, dear sir, slash madam. Personalise it, but also to keep it fairly concise and tailor it to the, uh, the interest of the employer. So my, my next question is that um, what do you think are some of the best industries in Australia for international students to step into? 
<laughs> but that's the best one. <laughs> Where the jobs are? Um, yeah, sorry, look. It varies. As most of you will be aware, Australia has a, a rather lopsided economic cycle that varies hideously from state to state to state. So the typical mining states of uh, Queensland, particularly in Western Australia, engineering jobs go there. There was a time uh, a decade ago, and it's re-emerging, we're in Queensland and, and um, Western Australia, mining jobs, engineering jobs, even transport jobs, you, you could not get enough workers. Um, in the long term, look, there's a couple of publications, ITECA has one that you can see, uh, looks at, look at long-term job growth. Um, curiously enough, um, human services is the longest sustainable one. It's also a good one because it's the one least affected by economic cycles. Uh, we have an ageing population, we have a nation that continues to invest more in healthcare. Uh, there are some long, good long-term jobs there that, as I said, are largely not interrupted by economic cycles. Uh, I'll only say a brief uh, uh, compliment to Troy's comment. Um, the published information, be it by Commonwealth government, uh, job agencies, state governments, is never never very accurate. It's always nine to 12 months uh, late. So if you're relying upon that information, uh, you're looking at what was going on in the labour market 12 months ago. Uh, so just going back to something that Sally and Troy said, your networks are going to give you the best insights into what's hot in the market at any given point in time. But I entirely agree with Troy's comment. Uh, if you have got an interest in human services, if you can't be replaced by a cobot, uh, you can't be replaced by an app. Uh, I trained as a lawyer. I don't imagine there's going to be a hell of a lot more, um, you know, basic level law jobs going forward. So if you're in a high touch industry uh, where where customization um, and face to face uh, is is hard to replace with technology, then then you're in a good space. But please don't rely upon published data. It is never up to date. Uh, your best source of information about what's going on in the la local labour market is those professional associations. I think I'd have to say it's, it's jobs where your natural attributes as international students are going to play well. So where your resilience, where your cross-cultural encounters, where your sociability skills, so those sorts of things are going to be most value. So um, think that through. Think what your skill set is, what works with your course though obviously if you're enrolled in a course you're going to want to head down that direction um, but think those through what again where that point of difference is that you as an international student are bringing um, and where those strengths really feed into an industry so my final question to all our panelists um, if you have to give one advice or the key advice to international students for the question how to take a bold step forward as an employee in Australia after student life? What would that be? Yeah. <laughs> we'd, we'd actually Look, like I, one from all of you. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I go back to something I said uh, very, very early on. You have life experience that three quarters of the students in Australia won't have. Um, a bit like Sally, I, I've spent a bit of time overseas and I came back a better person for it. I spent um, 12, 18 months working in New England, and I came back to an Australia as a more rounded person. Uh, you have that straight out of the door as graduates. Um, use it, sell it. You're, you're competing with, uh, you know, by the time you all graduate, typically there's a, you know, the same cohort of students who've all got accounting degrees, all got degrees in uh, hospitality management, have all got degrees in, in whatever. You have something that most of the domestic students don't, is international experience. Quite often, more often than not, a second language. Use that to your advantage. Um, you really exploit it. Um, yes, as I said, you, your CV in terms of your uh, volunteering will be great. Uh, certainly the fact that you finish your course, you know, that's the entry point. But you have experience that you cannot teach in Australia uh, in terms of your international experience uh, and exploit it. Uh, I'll say slightly more than I entirely agree, um, but I do entirely agree. I think you need to look for an employer who, who, um, who sees your strengths, going back to something that Sally said right at the beginning. Uh, um, I don't know the names of all the schools in New South Wales because I didn't grow up here. So when people talk about Shaw, I still don't really know what that means and I don't care. Uh, and I look for employers that don't care about that stuff. Uh, so if you're competing in a market where going to the right school, uh, going to the right university and having the right domestic networks that are four generations old, you know, you, that, that's a tough market to crack, even for a Kiwi. It's a tough market to crack. By contrast, if you're looking for employment in an industry that's highly international, 
you know, with international firms, uh, international offices, that really understands the benefit of multiple languages, living and working in different countries, having all that cultural capital that I don't have. I have none of that. Uh, those are the employers where you're going to do best. I don't think I'm telling you anything you don't know. Um, but I think, you know, owning your experience and being authentic is, is always going to work. You're not going to convince employers who actually want, uh, you know, a cookie cutter to fit into the, into the model that's well established and has worked for them. Uh, you're going to work best with an employer who actually understands your strengths. I think my comment would be be bold using the question. So be bold in a couple of ways. Um, one is, like, I guess the key to it is have a strategy for where you want to end up and then work out how you're going to get there and who you need to know that will help you get there. So one of the slides from the previous speaker was about, you know, and one of the comments was employers think you're going to run off because you're international and you've got too many ties at home. If you show you've actually got a plan and a strategy for this is where I want to end up and it is in Australia and it is doing X, then work out who the key people are to know, think that you are good enough to get there, you have the skills to get there, and that these people will care about knowing you if you show that. So go have a coffee with them and, <laughs> and, and, and convince them of that. Right? When they get to know you, they'll, they'll believe in you as well. So, yeah, be bold in a couple of ways. And, and by thinking outside the box about where your skills are and how you can keep them going and how you can utilise them best. So I left academia because I wanted to try something different. I hadn't done anything different in my life. And I thought, what else is out there that's worth giving a go? And so I sort of was looking at teaching roles and what have you. And eventually I came across policy and research officer and went, well, I can research. Don't know much about the policy stuff. Turns out it's the policy stuff in my job I actually like the most. So. <laughs> and I love this job. So, yeah, be bold. Something will be out there that will surprise you. Um, if anyone have questions to ask with the panellists, we'd like to welcome you. specialises in international students. I've taken international students on staff and internships, so I've got to be available for being with international students and I get the problems that they have. Um, so any help that you can do to strategise, to make a CV more impressionable and to just give yourself a fighting chance, I agree with. However, when I've been recruiting in the UK and Australia, I've, when it comes to getting people work, uh, there's a very distinctive difference in Australia. I found a obviously when we group, we sell to our very own experience and then sort of stuff thereafter. Okay, it's what the employers want. Okay. But I find Australian employers are very dismissive of overseas experience. Yeah. Very dismissive, it's very frustrating. I mean people have some really good experience from overseas, unless you've got the other attributes and you do sell on that, but it's to the point that it won't entertain more than six seconds of the CV. Okay? Um, so there's a massive cultural change that's needed there. It's quite often how it's sold. Um, I've got some colleagues who work fairly sensibly in the mining industry. Uh, and if you simply say, look, I you know, speak another language, I come from somewhere else, it's dismissed yeah. almost instantly. If you look at that company and it's got operations in South America or in Asia, that's the tie, and it comes back to an earlier point, is tie that into how it's relevant to the company. Uh, with one of our communications jobs, we've got a person who speaks about three Asian languages. We gave him the job because it solves a whole heap of challenges we've had in supporting international ed education in uh, Vietnam and China. Now, straight up and down, I would not have thought about an international student uh, graduate who uh, spoke three languages, thought, no, didn't think it. The person on the CV said, I can help ITECA with its uh, overseas market, and particularly Southeast Asia, but in this case, Vietnam and China. Hey, a bit of a no-brainer. Um, in fact, I might have even looked at the other CVs, but I, quite frankly, I didn't get much beyond that one. And so from your perspective, um, in, in addressing this point, it, it's a case of tailoring that um, experience to the relevance of the employer. Now, sometimes it's just not going to be relevant, and, and that's it. But uh, you, if you're looking, whether it be with one of the uh, big four consulting firms, the accounting firms, whether it be with the state government, um, tailor that experience to how it's relevant. Yeah, I just... I totally get that and as a problem and um, as a peak body the best way we can deal with it is just to work with employers where we can to influence them and and it's a, I mean it's a deeply ingrained cultural problem but 
isn't going to change overnight. And so it is just a matter of telling the story. And that's what we continually feed back to government as well about international students and international education. It's about society's reputation, like the society's kind of perception of it and making sure that there aren't myths truths out there, making sure that the positive stories are told and it's not all doom and gloom and the focus on the negatives. We have to really sell up those positives and that's, but that's going to take a long time to shift the mental strategy of people. So we'll wrap up this panel now. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for helping us out with this. And as Dr. Sally said, just ask for a cup of coffee. <laughs> um, you um, thank you so much for all your valuable time sharing your experience and insights to all international students. We'd like to give a small gift for commitment. <laughs>